Hey, we're live. Welcome everybody to another Sales Hacker webinar. Thank you for hanging out with us for the next 45 minutes, 60 minutes or so. My name's Alex. We've never met before. I've been working with Colin and Scott behind the scenes on our webinars for the past six months or so. And today I'm gonna be your host. We're talking about new SDR, new BDR onboarding. A lot of companies are doing it. Not everybody's doing it well. That's what we're talking about today. Luckily for you guys, I'm not the only one talking about it. We have two people joining us who are like real experts when it comes to, to onboarding your new reps. Dave Kennett, who are you? What do you do? Yeah, hey, thanks, Alex. Uh, I'm really excited about this conversation. It's a topic I'm very passionate about. So uh, I am the CEO and founder of a company called Replace. And um, I've been, uh, you know, I've been in sales my, my whole career, sales leadership the last 15 years or so. And uh, super excited to dive into this topic. Sweet. Thank you, Dave. Uh, also joining us is Reva Pellerin. She is business development manager at Vidyard, uh, managing a team of reps. She handles a lot of onboarding at Vidyard. Reva, how are you doing? What do you do? Where are you from? Yeah, yeah, thanks. So um, I am a BDR manager here at Vidyard. I've been at Vidyard for about four and a half years uh, previously on the sales team and uh, currently lead a team of 10 reps. Uh, so a lot of my job is onboarding new reps as we continue to grow our team out. Awesome. That sounds great. So like I said, we got the right people in the room to talk about onboarding your new reps. It's something that's really important. You know, there's this stat that gets thrown around all the time of 50% of all new reps never ramping up to meet quota. That's bad. That's really not a great stat. Uh, and that's what this webinar is about today to make sure you don't kind of fall into that trap of constantly churning out new reps, constantly having to hire new reps, right? How do you systematically take the knowledge of your veteran reps, pass it down to your new reps about your market, about your ICPs, about the pain that your, pro that your product solves and the messaging you use to communicate that, right? That's really what onboarding is about and that's what we're gonna cover today. Uh, and what I'm really kind of excited about is Rava joining us because they're using some really cool innovative tactics with video. So they're kind of incorporating video into their onboarding process to take that knowledge from their veteran reps and to trickle it down into their new reps to try to beat that 50% of reps never meeting quota statistic. Uh, so I think you guys are gonna find a lot of value here. But before we get into the meaty content, we have a couple of housekeeping items. Um, so down at the bottom of your screen, we're getting some messages that video is frozen. Can uh, Dave or Reva please confirm or deny? How does the video look for you guys? Fine Looks for good. Okay. So we're just gonna continue. Um, super quick housekeeping items down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little chat icon. Go ahead and click on that. Um, and then you'll see an all panelists or all panelists and attendees option. Please click on the all panelists and attendees option. If you have any questions, that's how you make sure your questions get answered. Um, so all panelists and attendees. And right now what I want all of you to do on the webinar is to introduce yourself. Who are you? Where are you from? What company do you work for? What's your title? Uh, and if you have any questions like top of mind, questions that you just wanna get off your chest about your new user onboarding, go ahead and put those in chat right now. Uh, frozen video, video frozen here. Looks like we're having some technical difficulties. Chase from Shiphawk, he's an SDR, welcome. Susan from Stony Creek. Mike is a BDR manager from Axiom Law. Welcome, Mike. VP of Revenue Operations at Sales Barbecue, Greg. Welcome, welcome. So it looks like we're getting a lot of black video here. Um, I wonder if we should um, jump off and restart. I don't know. Yeah, I think we're getting some messages that video is good for me, video is okay for me. We're just gonna continue. I think it may just be with my video and really, you know, I'm not the expert here. It's mainly gonna be you guys. So as long as they can see you, I don't care if they can't see me. Uh, right on. Uh, cool, so Dave, uh, let's kick it off here. Why should these guys care about new rep onboarding? What's the big deal? Why is this so important? Why do you think now we have that stat of like 50% of reps never meeting quota? What's going wrong? Yeah, I think there's a couple things. So um, I, I have had the benefit of leading teams for many years. And I have to say, to be very honest, very vulnerable here, uh, I've done a, a great job at onboarding, I think, sometimes where I'd get a, 
nine out of 10 probably, and I've done an absolute terrible job um, where I'd probably get a one out of 10, if that, hopefully more towards the beginning of my career. And so it's over time where I learned the importance. And, you know, we're going to be getting into some very tactical areas where we can recommend that um, people, uh, especially first time managers who haven't maybe been through it before, can up their game with respect respect to uh, making it a fantastic experience for the rep and getting up to speed on quota quicker. But the first thing in my mind is how you make them feel. It's just like that old line that uh, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. We all know how it feels to start a brand new role. There's that sort of anxiety slash excitement for a lot of us. And the next, um, you know, you've got your family, your friends, your partners saying, hey, good, good job, like congrats and, and good luck tomorrow on your first day. And everyone's asking you when you get home that night and they're pinging you during the day, how was that first day? Well, I think it's our job as leaders to make sure they feel uh, valued, they feel important, and that they can report back to their friends, family, and partner and say, it was amazing. Uh, I, I think day number one, was great. And we're going to get into a number of areas where we recommend um, that would be helpful to do that. But overall, to kind of frame the discussion, that's why for me, over time, it became an absolute priority to have an actual onboarding checklist pre-hire and make sure, or pre-start date, and make sure that the day gets off the right start. Yeah, that's a great point. Just making sure you have that process nailed down so you can check off the list. Bang, 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 making sure you're not missing anything. Yep. Um, Reva, anything to add there, you know, in terms of the importance of onboarding or how you guys do it at Vidyard? Um, any sort of checklist or process that you guys use to make sure all your new reps feel welcome and feel like they're valuable, kind of like Dave just mentioned? Yeah, I think the kind of soft parts that you mentioned, Dave, are so, so important. And um, I'll talk about a bit more broadly just about Vid Vidyard really emphasizes a good onboarding experience. So even before you start onboarding for your specific role uh, at Vidyard, we do, we have a, we call it a V-Buddy uh, off of our mascot V-Bot. And as a new a new person at the company, you're paired with someone at the company that's supposed to, you know, show you the office, have lunch with you that first day, give that good first experience, make you feel like you made a good decision. Um, but then, like Dave said, we do have an extensive checklist for the BDR role specifically to make sure that they're now learning how they're going to be successful in their specific role. Totally get it. So Reva, what I'm, I kind of want to dive into, you mentioned on our pre-webinar call, for those of you on the webinar who aren't familiar with this, uh, us three, had a, we have pre-webinar calls for every webinar where we hop on for like 30 minutes and just kind of go over briefly what we're going to be covering during the webinar. And Reva mentioned something really interesting in that they use video to pass on the knowledge from their veteran reps down to their less senior reps. Can you kind of give us like a feel or a taste of what that looks like and how maybe people on the webinar could adopt that themselves? Yeah, definitely. So uh, I think all of us probably have been through a situation where it seems like a lot of the knowledge on a new role is like tribal knowledge and in the tenured reps heads. So we use video a few different ways to help share that knowledge to new reps. The first is through a self-service model. So uh, at Vidyard, when you start as a BDR, you are coming into a pretty stacked sales tech stack of what we use and setting those tools up and then knowing how to use them efficiently. It's a learning curve. So we have a library of videos that tenured reps and managers have uh, recorded over the over time. And we've done that through our tool uh, the Chrome extension that we have. And that way, reps that are coming into the team, they can watch those videos as they set up their call recording, Salesforce, uh, Sales Loft, and all those tools they're going to be using. And also learn tips and tricks from those tenured reps on what's the best way to get a lead from LinkedIn to, into Salesforce, for instance. Uh, so that's one way we use video in onboarding. The second, though, is these new BDRs are often selling into the B2B space or to these buyer personas that we sell to for the first time ever. So the messaging is often totally foreign to them. So they will also do uh, a lot of watching videos that, so 
at Vidyard, we, we use video in our sales process and in prospecting. So we are often reaching out with videos instead of email. And uh, new reps will watch those videos to really understand how are tenured reps speaking about Vidyard, speaking about the industry challenges, and kind of talking about the alignment there for prospects. I think that's huge, right? I, uh, getting familiar with the messaging and how you communicate the value of your product and the pain that it solves for your prospects, like being able to just hop on a video and learn how reps are currently doing that, um, that seems like a really cool way to do that. Dave, let's talk about pitfalls of onboarding. Uh, I know that you've been involved with onboarding, I don't, what'd you say, 50, hundreds? Uh, how many new reps would you say you've onboarded in your career? I don't know, but hundreds for sure. And uh, many of those being SDRs and BDRs. Yeah, I would imagine uh, going through that process, there's, you've noticed some common pitfalls. Maybe you've experienced them at the beginning of your experience in onboarding. Maybe you've fallen into a couple of these pitfalls. Um, can you explain what some of those are? Yeah, for sure. Why don't we put them into categories? Now let's put them in categories of day one and then specifically sales conversations and quota. So when I look at day one, I agree. I mean, Rava's points were so, uh, they so resonate with me in terms of making sure that day one's great. So um, we would get to the point where finally we'd have um, a, a nice letter on their desk. So their workspace is ready. Their computer is in place. Nothing worse than you haven't got their business cards ordered. You haven't got their computer ordered. Their email doesn't work on day one. Like those things are the worst. So those are common pitfalls. Um, and if you want it to be a great experience for that rep and want them to feel valued, I would absolutely have their computer set up, ready to go, their email ready to go. Um, I would have an onboarding to sort of reduce the anxiety and let them know that um, there's a structure and thought process around what you put together. It's important, I think, to have pretty much every hour pretty much scripted for the first couple of weeks in terms of here's what it looks like. Um, and, um, I, and like I said, we would literally put welcome letters on their desk. And that was, uh, and, and it wasn't in a cheesy way. It was literally like, hey, we value you. We're excited you're on board. Uh, if you have the company swag, throw that on there too, right? Get them their shirt early or whatever it is. Um, and so um, the hiring manager making a point of being a free on day one for lunch, I would get to the point where I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't okay a start date for my sales reps um, if, my, if the sales manager couldn't actually meet with them that first day. So the sales manager has to be there, has to be present in my opinion. Um, and then an onboarding buddy, absolutely key. So that's sort of day one and a few, a few things there. In terms of quota and sales conversations, um, I think it's important. One pitfall is uh, reps get full quota too quickly. And then right off the bat, they're on their back foot and they don't feel successful. Uh, the second thing I see is uh, the opposite of that. People thinking, hey, it's going to take three months for them to fully ramp when really it doesn't have to. Um, all the time, depending on the sales motion, how enterprisey it is, et cetera. But if we're talking SDRs and BDRs, um, if it's one new hire, I would have a ramp of pipe, but I would say, hey, in month one, month two, month three, this is the crescendo of the pipeline we're expecting or number of past leads, SQLs, whatever. Um, and I would give them uh, benchmarks of what past SDRs have done because by nature, we sales folks are competitive and we wanna know how, how we rank and then support the heck out of them in doing that. And I guess the second thing is, if you're doing a wave of hiring and you've got a group of SDRs or BDRs starting at once, or AEs for that matter, uh, I always think it's great to do a group target. So if there's four SDRs and they're coming at, through as a cohort together, really get them build that sense of team, right? It's like years into my tenure at organizations, I really felt close to those folks that were on my onboarding in day one. And so helping foster that is important, but setting uh, group goals. And then finally, I think in terms of custom, customer conversations, we need to be pushed off the ledge sometimes in a good supportive way. I know that it's not a great analogy for a good supportive way, but uh, how about pushed into the deep end? Let's say that. Uh, and so in that case, I think it's super important to um, position them with a ton of role plays. Um, and as Reva was saying, customer stories, talk tracks, etc. And so when they're, um, I, I always say, by day, let's say, whatever it is, day eight, I tell them what day their first customer conversation is going to be so that every minute they spend, they realize, okay, this is impactful. I got to listen. I got to pay attention and I got to prepare. And then um, with that, I tell them just to take the pressure off. 
we all know those first, first 15 to 20 uh, customer conversations are going to suck. It just is what it is relative to how you're going to sound in a couple months. And so that takes the pressure off a bit. We put them in front of some low impact, low risk prospects and, and away they go. So those are some uh, sort of stream of consciousness thoughts on, on some of my, some of the pitfalls we see and some of the best practices I recommend. You mentioned too much quota too quickly, right? A question we always get on like a lot of our webinars is the activity-based compensation versus like a, a more bottom of funnel pipeline-based compensation for new reps. The thought process being if you use like an activity-based compensation, number of calls, number of uh, cold emails, something like that, you take some of that pressure off so they don't have to worry about actually generating revenue in their first three, six, nine months. Um, Whereas, you know, on the opposite end, uh, you're not compensating them based on pipeline, which comes with its own detriments. Uh, can you talk to us a bit about your preferred method of compensation for new reps there? Yeah, for sure. I have a strong opinion on this. So uh, to me, uh, activity is price of admission, right? Um, we expect that when we bring someone on, we vet them for the fact that they're uh, driven, internally motivated, they're competitive, and they want to get out there and do it. So I expect when I bring someone on as a sales professional, that they're going to uh, want to do the minimum number of calls, emails, et cetera. And, you know, everyone listening knows it's not necessarily about the quantity as well. It's about the quality, but in terms of those to me are, Hey, if you're not, if you're not um, hitting the mark, we'll start looking at activities, but more than anything, to me, it's about in an SDR BDR role, what level of pipes being generated and, what do what is your sort of um, sales accepted lead to s uh, sales uh, qualified lead to sales accept, sorry sales qualified lead to sales accepted lead look like and um, what does the close rate look like then for the AE? Are you actually passing good qualified deals and what's the uh, what's the amount of pipeline that you're generating? So I just think that let's face it, we're all measured on our bottom line performance for the organization. So I want to focus on that on day one. Uh, activities are important, showing guidelines is important, but to me, it's always having a bright spotlight on the actual pipe generated and closed deals and revenue. Is that a similar way that you guys do it over at Vidyard, Reva? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, you know, activity is table stakes and um, we kind of have the perspective that if you're if you're doing the activity, the results will come. So, so focus on the results. Um, so yeah, we're, we're the exact same. It's a ramp quota for every new rep um, with the expectation that we're, we're kind of sharing with them what past ramp, ramped reps have, have achieved. You also mentioned something, Dave, training a cohort of reps at the same time, you know, let's say you're scaling a sales team and you actually have the opportunity to do that, where you can bring on like three or four new reps at the same time that you have them go through the onboarding at the same time. I'd imagine that like drives up a sense of like competition, right? Like I want to do better than the rep next to me. Um, I know a lot of salespeople are competitive by nature anyway. Uh, can we talk, can we dive a little bit deeper into that aspect? I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, for sure. I think the competition, a healthy competition is important, but I'm very cautious to not make it too much of a competition. I want it to be a team feel. I want it to be a band of brothers and sisters going through there and feeling like they're working towards a common goal. So I will ask my the sales leader to give them a, um, that cohort a group target. And so they all feel that they're working towards it. And I want people to feel like they're getting called out on day one. I want them to have a sense of obligation to the team for sure. Um, but to me, uh, that, that sort of group feel that we're working together to achieve something I think is uh, very, very important. So uh, that is sort of, and, and if I have a sales rep, let's say a BDR that would, could start in two weeks and another one that could start in four weeks and another one that could start in three weeks, I will absolutely start all three in four weeks. Um, it's just the amount of productivity you're going to get and morale that's built by having, in my experience anyway, by having that team feel so much more important than having a, an earlier start uh, for, for a couple reps. So that's, um, that's how I think about, about it. Yeah. Um, I gotcha. I gotcha. So it sounds like we got the foundational stuff built in, right? Step one of onboarding your foundational stuff. You put the nice little welcome letter on their desk. You make sure their tech set setup is all done for them. You know, if you're using like a single sign on like Okta or something, they have access to all the applications they need. Their computer's all set up. They can log in. Um, 
maybe you've assigned them an onboarding buddy. Yeah. Uh, some of the common pitfalls being too much quota too quickly. Uh, you know, you don't want to overwhelm them, but not necessarily using an activity-based or, you know, for asking Dave, never using activity-based uh, compensation method metrics uh, and instead moving more bottom of the funnel where we're using, you know, SQLs, SALs, pipeline generated. Um, and then also low impact, low risk calls, right? Don't give them the most important account of the company, the most important contacts of the company and throw them into the wild and have them prospect into that account, right? That's a recipe for failure. Okay, so foundational, let's move on to like more in the weeds, step two, right? Um, what's next? You have all that foundational stuff in place. Talk to me a bit more about next steps. Let's go with Dave. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, to me, it comes down to a solid understanding of two things. A, the product and the solution. Uh, B, the customer persona, right? So the, the prospects you're reaching out to, what's the profile, what resonates with them in general? And then uh, super important from there um, to really truly understand what resonates in terms of uh, case understanding case studies, customer stories. And so this is where my belief in a coaching culture comes in and um, really creating, I create a boot camp for our new reps where um, it's X number of weeks, we've got it scripted beginning to end, and it includes graduating from being able to do role plays of each step of the conversation. So if you're a BDR, SDR, there's the cold outreach aspect. There's the, okay, I've got the prospect on the phone and now I'm going through my BANT or medic or whatever those heuristics are that you want before you pass the lead. Um, and it's really being able to effectively um, go through role plays to graduate from boot camp on handling the most common objections and being able to share customer stories or what we at replays call customer sound bites where you just you know we see pitfalls where a rep will try and memorize a 12 page case study that uh, takes five minutes to tell well we all know you don't have that time and nor should we ever expect the prospect to have that attention span when they're taking a call out of the blue um, and conversely they'll say oh i have a case study and that i'll send it to you later and it's like no 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 it's important to me that the sdr is equipped to very quickly when they uncover a pain to, to quickly be able to say, you know what, totally get it. We have a customer uh, that was just a prospect a few months ago. They were in your exact situation. Here's the, and we call it the what. This is the thing that they were a struggle with. Here's the so what, why did it, how did we help them and why does it matter? And here's a quick customer story soundbite. It's just 20 seconds where you overview the customer pain and how you solved it. That should take no more than one minute. And we recommend that the new sales rep is very well versed in the, the two or three key differentiators of their new company. And they have these customer story sound bites tied to it. And then just massive role plays with each other um, to do that. But that's where I love, so Vidyard, who's actually a customer of replays, um, has some fantastic tips on how to do that in, a, in an efficient way. And I know Rave is gonna talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, so I'll say the, like, if I, if I just, preface it with the common pitfalls we see in our onboarding we're always reiterating on our process but one is um, onboarding programs might be a bit too passive so you're doing a lot of kind of brain dumping of knowledge on these reps and theoretically they get the industry and the buyer persona and things like that but then when they go to do they realize a lot of that content was not retained because they didn't have the time to test the content throughout the process. So one way we kind of overcome that pit, pitfall at Vidyard is we want to have a good balance of teaching, whether that's like through presentation, but also testing of that knowledge. So an example is we might go through a lot of content about what marketers care about. That's one of our big buyer personas, what marketers care about, what their problems are and what, what kind of customer stories we have in that space. As a takeaway test, the new rep now needs to go create a video telling a story about a customer challenge, that uh, what the challenge was, who the customer is, why they decided to partner with Vidyard and what the outcome was. So that's helping a few different things. One, it's getting a customer story under their belt, but it's also helping them contextualize a lot of information that they were getting thrown at them in onboarding and make make that story their own. So um, we, we really try to strike a balance between 
And it's also kind of getting to the fact that everyone learns differently. Maybe someone's going to retain 80% of that presentation, but maybe someone else is only going to retain 20 and they really need to do and say to really retain the rest of that. Um, so that's one, one thing we really incorporate into our onboarding. Um, I'll say too that, um, and, and Dave, you mentioned, you know, those first 15 to 20 calls you make as a new rep, they're pretty terrible, they're pretty anxiety inducing. Um, and so we find that um, something else we try to do with the new reps watching old reps video, it takes that anxiety down a bit because they're getting a visual of, okay, this is what people that are eight months more tenured than me are saying, this is the messaging, and they can practice that messaging in a safe space. It's not on a cold call. They can take a few takes at how they're going to create a video to send to a prospect before they actually send one out. So we really like that um, mix of teaching but then testing and also giving them a safe space to really practice their pitch and then get feedback from their mentors and managers. I like that a lot. Um... That was that really cool aspect of incorporating video into your onboarding that I mentioned at the beginning of the call. You know, when you say customer story and communicating a customer story via video, they're not sending that to a prospect. They're sending that to their manager for feedback and getting that iterative process going before they reach out at all to any prospects. That's correct. Yeah, exactly. And we actually do some fun things like we call them head to head. So this is kind of continuous coaching, but every week in my team meeting, for instance, I'll select two people from the team, choose two customer stories, and we're going to watch both of your videos in next week's meeting. Whoever has the more compelling story based on a peer um, uh, review is going to get like a coffee card for the week. That's awesome. Yeah. Yet another example of, you know, training in cohorts, right, Dave? Um, yep. finding ways to stimulate that, that group training. Um, that's amazing. Totally. So the boot camp for onboarding. I mean, we mentioned a lot of things, a lot of different aspects of the onboarding process that you can train your reps on, you know, being your market, your ICPs, the messaging you use to communicate to the market, um, the actual tactics you use for cold outreach, whether that be, you know, using video and emails, just straight text-based emails, cold calling, um, objection handling, customer story sound bites of all those things. The one that may not be obvious to the audience is that customer story sound bite. I'd really like to dive deeper into that. And can we, can we like kind of dissect what that looks like at Vidyard, Reva? Um, yeah. So do you mean uh, how we help BDRs learn those customer stories? Exactly. Like if I'm a new BDR and I joined Vidyard and I know nothing about what you guys do or very little, you know, just what I learned picked up when I was interviewing, um, how would you take me through that process? Yeah, so we um, ex we kind of hire for people that are like a, a lot of the things Dave mentioned characteristics, but another one is self learners. So we want to be able to give them a lot of information and they can take what they want from it. We have on our website, for instance, uh, a number of customer stories that are presented in that way of challenge the customer was having, why they partnered with Vidyard, Vidyard and what this outcome was. So um, through, there's supposed, uh, we have, um, new reps will be asked to, to learn two or three of those stories and tell them through video. And we, we continue to coach on storytelling needs to have that, you know, beginning, middle and end. And so we really coach on you know, I think you could set the stage a bit better by talking about who the customer is and what the challenge was, not just memorizing what we wrote in the story, but think critically about what that challenge was. And then um, building that curiosity and then letting them know what the solution was and why that matters so much. And then how can that be applicable to other companies. So we do break it apart and continue to give that feedback on where we think they could improve to tell a powerful story. Um, we also, using video again, we get our customer success team, for instance, they will do customer spotlight videos, either from themselves or for the, from the customer themselves, telling us about how they use Vidyard. So I think any company has this where a customer comes on board because they're thinking they're going to solve problem X, but when they actually start using the tool, they're doing something totally different with it. Or 
over the years of being a customer, they change the way they use the tool. So continuously learning from our CS team and the customers themselves about how they're using our tool and then learning those stories is also really helpful for our team. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, this is like new school onboarding, right? We're using customer stories via video, teaching, passing on that knowledge from veteran reps to our new reps. I imagine this is not something that was going on like five, five years ago, even 10 years ago, right? Can we talk a little bit about the changes that have been taking place in onboarding new reps? Like what did this process look like five years ago, Dave? And how is that different than like how you do it now? Or even like when you started, when you started onboarding new reps, take your first, your first year as a manager onboarding new reps, what did that look like? And uh, how are you doing things differently? I'm so glad you didn't say 25 years ago. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> so um, in all seriousness, it probably was, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago though, 15 years ago, 15 or 20. Anyway, um, well, I, I would say that the biggest change is, um, the things that don't change is how we want to make people feel, right? It's, um, you know, we all know that my Angelo, uh, Angelo quote or you know, something to the effect of it's not, what people say it's it's how they made you feel if you remember and i really believe that on uh, day one and through the onboarding and throughout their whole tenure but especially on day one and um, in terms of what it used to look like uh, versus now i think some of the, the technology advancements allow for a st more streamlined experience and uh, like reva was saying so the fact that we've got the ability to you know for for everyone listening whatever screen share technology you're using today there's got to be a record button there. Um, if you're fortunate enough to be using um, a tool like Vidyard or something like that, it just opens up um, the world that you've got in terms of being able to have the reps uh, very easily and simply review highlight reels, the best of the SDRs and BDRs that are doing it today. And by the way, I noticed a question earlier of what's BDR versus SDR. I'm just using those terms interchangeably for people that are building pipeline in an outbound motion or maybe even inbound. Uh, so that's just how I'm using that term. But um, so uh, today we're able to consume videos and why I think that's important is a couple things. Before it was, okay, we'd have to sit there and do joint calls or be on a splitter or what have you. We don't now. We can consume it around uh, our schedule. It can be uh, outside of selling hours. It can be um, done at our convenience, which I think is, is super helpful. And it's also, you know, I, I still am a firm believer in sitting down in pairs of threes. So for those of you listening that haven't probably heard me say this before, uh, for new sales managers, I really recommend this. You take your reps and you take uh, one that will be the customer, one that will be uh, role play the sales rep, and one that will role play being the observer. And you present them with a couple of problems and away they go in terms of outreach or, you, or not problems, but a customer scenario or a prospect scenario. And uh, so the salesperson's doing the selling, the um, customers being the customer and kind of reading off the two or three key pain points they're supposed to mention and the observer is giving feedback. And so I think it's super important if you're gonna do that to create a safe learning environment. But what's neat now is, to, and to get directly to answer your question, is these role plays can be done via video and consumed by the sales leader and the sales enablement folks and the onboarding folks and the trainers um, at the end of the day or at nighttime or what have you. It doesn't have to be right there and then when it happens. So to me, that is a very important aspect of how things uh, have changed. I mean, I'm very biased towards um, the technology side of things, of course, not only because I've been in tech for a while, but the, the way I think it's streamlined uh, coaching is amazing. Watching sales uh, videos and being able to give feedback that way via video is um, an important game changer. So, um, you know, I, I, don't, I think there's 80% of the onboarding that hasn't changed at all since day one. But 20%, I think, is a pretty cool inflection point when you look at the video capabilities today. And that, that, that pre-call role-playing that you're doing, and you're using tech to kind of supplement and make that more efficient, and that you can pass it up to leadership and get that iterative process of feedback going, you're also using that post-call, right? I mean, that's not just pre-call role-playing. Are you recording calls that your reps are having with actual prospects and giving them feedback that way as well? And if so, can you talk a bit about that process? Is that for me or Reva? That is for you, Dave. 
Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. So um, replays is in month seven. We're early days and we're going quickly, but I don't have an SDR team yet. So I'm more speaking to my past experience leading lots of SDRs and that absolutely would have been um, uh, pre and post. So it's, I think, extremely important to be looking at, uh, at both. Rava, how about yourself? I mean, we, we mentioned customer stories and the role that those play in onboarding new reps before they're reaching out with prospects to prospects. Um, do you have a similar process for reps that are still new, let's say in month three or whatever, reaching out to prospects, right? They're on calls, they're sending emails. What sort of fail safe, I guess you could call it, maybe not a fail safe. What sort of process do you have set up that you can make that iterative so they can get feedback continually? Yeah. So, um, I think that, uh, first of all, we have a mentorship program. So everyone has a BDR mentor um, and they meet with them on a weekly basis to bounce ideas off them. And if they're hitting roadblocks, get some peer uh, perspective on the issue. Um, in terms of from post onboarding and just continuous coaching, we have a few different ways where we're kind of spot checking or getting feedback on our messaging. Because number one, our messaging is always changing. We're adapting to what's working and what's not in the industry. Um, but also, you know, a new product might come out or we might not have a new use case or something. So we're always kind of tweaking our messaging. So whether it's, we have a Slack channel set up, for instance, we call it Vidyard Wins. And anytime someone wins, not anytime, I mean, we have too many wins to do this, but anytime someone has a fun win they want to share, they'll share it with the broader team and they'll put the email that they sent out and the video they sent out. So that now everyone, so sales reps, BDRs, SDRs can watch that video and say, oh, like, that's a really cool way to talk about our Marketo integration or this value proposition we have, I'm going to start using that in my videos. So that's just one of many ways we have for continuous coaching. Um, as, a, as a manager, I'm always setting a chunk of time a day to look at my reps videos and watch their videos and give feedback on what I think they did well and what I think they could improve on. Um, and then every week uh, where our team is very in the pattern of what meetings did you book last week and can you share the video that led to booking that meeting with the team so we can all learn from that that video again just passing on that knowledge of people who are successful today and how they're doing it what they're doing and um, how other people can use that right yeah exactly it's really cool that we can use tech right record everything and just pass it on uh, it gets rid of that need for sitting in on calls yeah and actually kind of uh to that point and riffing on what Dave mentioned on how tech can really help onboarding, I think the double-edged sword there is that we can kind of dip into the side of relying too much on tech to onboard and we lose that face-to-face -face and making that person's first experience with the company a good one. And so, you know, there is that potential where I set my new rep up and I say, here are 50 pre-recorded -re pre videos you can sit in a room and watch them all. And I don't think that's the right way to use tech, but it's more along what Dave and you are saying, where it's have that face-to-face -face during the day, but then offline or off hours, I can watch these videos and, and give feedback at that point. So that aspect of onboarding, that's not technical, right? Dave, you mentioned 80% of onboarding hasn't changed, right? It's still making the prospect feel good, you know, learning about your market, learning about your ICPs, learning the messaging that resonates. Uh, learning the unique value prop of your product. Um, what else besides those I just rattled off, bang, 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 or are any of those so important that you want to dive into those deeper? Like, I guess what I'm saying is let's dive into that 80% of onboarding that hasn't changed. And why, why hasn't it changed? Why is it so important that it's just like stayed there while tech has been innovating around it? Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, there's so many different use cases out there. Let's talk about the scenario of folks that are listening who are maybe leading uh, global teams or remote teams. You know, that is, um, is becoming more and more common, as we all know. And so ensuring that that remote rep feels uh, valued, it's so important. I think if, uh, if, the, you know, if you can afford it, 
uh, I would argue oftentimes you can't afford not to, to have them fly out to the head office and spend time, if they are working from home remotely, and spend time getting to know the key folks in the different departments, spend time with their sales leader, spend time with an onboarding buddy for like literally a week or two sometimes. Fly them out for a week, send them home for the weekend, fly them back. Um, and for large organizations, that works. Smaller organizations, I know what you're saying because I'm living it myself. You're saying, I can't afford that. Are you crazy? Um, and I get that. So that's where I think it's super important to have daily huddles. Um, that's what I would be. That's another best practice I would do to make sure people are feeling included. Uh, so at the end of each day, we'd be talking about what did we learn today? Um, what, uh, how are we feeling? Like you know, frequent check-ins. So this is from the sales leader to the new hire. And, uh, and then the next morning, uh, here's what you can expect for the next day. The next morning you have a, a quick uh, huddle for 10 or 15 minutes, again, reviewing what you're gonna go through. There's so much learning that takes place in the first few weeks. We all know what it feels like. Your head's usually spinning, especially in an SDR role. And um, so at nighttime, people are usually either trying to cram from what they learned that day, or they're just trying to chill because it was such a whirlwind. And either way, I think it's important to keep frequent touches with them to get your arms around them because if the onboarding's done right, yes, they're gonna feel great, but they will, there's no question that regardless of whether best practices are, are followed, uh, we're human, right? And people are gonna feel overwhelmed at certain points of time. So I think it's critical as a sales leader to be in touch with that and make sure that you're leading through the overwhelm and being like, hey, uh, empathy wise, I get it, I've been there. And um, you want it to be an overall good experience. So um, I would be doing daily uh, Zoom calls or video calls with my remote reps if they couldn't fly in or if I couldn't fly out to be in, in their area. Um, I also think, you know, if you, so again, let's go to the use case of larger global organization, you're a sales leader leading different groups of SDRs. Um, and let's say in one of your offices, you've got three or four SDRs starting. Um, if you can't make it out there for that first week, and again, you heard me say before that I think this, the, the hiring manager absolutely needs to be there in day one, but let's say in a remote scenario, that's just not possible. Then I think it's important to have um, a very awesome lead team lead fly out um, if they can and spend time um, and 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 i think that really helps build a connection to head office and it gives a fantastic leadership opportunity i mean that's the other thing we should probably explore a little bit is onboarding isn't only um, a, a great opportunity to do it right with your new reps but it's a great leadership opportunity for your existing reps and to really give those folks that have set in their career path that uh, they're an SDR and they want to be an SDR manager one day or a leader at one point um, or a team lead. Uh, this is a great opportunity to have them take on that unofficial capacity um, and, um, and really prep them for it and debrief with them at the end as well and say, how was that experience for you? How did it go? Uh, I think it's an important part of people's development. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just having that career path defined for your junior SDRs to go into that lead role. You know, we mentioned in our pre-webinar call, we went down this path of like sales leaders and onboarding and how they relate. Um, you mentioned that there were some common pitfalls. We already covered a few of those of like sales leaders when they're implementing a new onboarding process for, you know, let's say they have a team of managers already. But let's say maybe they don't have a team of managers. They just have a team of reps if you're a startup. Um, what are those pitfalls? What can we watch out for as a sales leader uh, yeah. when we're implementing, let's say, a new onboarding process? Yeah, I think, you know, it, it, the funny thing is it's really easy to sit here and say what people should do and what the pitfalls are. So I get that what I'm about to say is in a perfect world and we don't all live in a perfect world every time and every day, right? Things come up. You might have a personal vacation planned. You might have uh, a conference scheduled and it, you know, so I, I think ideally you've got the checklist in place. You're making sure day one is awesome. You've got an onboarding buddy. Um, so pitfalls are a lot of companies don't do any of those, or uh, maybe they do one or two. They don't do all of them. I think ensuring, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about life hacks and I think it's important in terms of life hacks within a new company of knowing who are your go-to people. Um, in terms of different functional groups, whether it's in marketing, whether it's in product, whether it's in IT, et cetera. And I think, 
I think that's super important as well is giving them an orientation to who's who and who your resources are. Um, and I think that's not done enough. People, sales leaders think, oh, no, it's fine just to um, get you an onboarding buddy on the sales team and away you go. Um, I think the other thing is they um, aren't checked in with enough, right? It's like often you'll, someone will get off to a great day one, you check in with them as their leader and away they go. Um, and you don't talk to them for a week. Um, I think daily calls at the end of the day, like I said, just to ask how the day went, how things were. Um, hopefully you've been involved with them throughout some portion of the day already, but some days it's just not realistic and that's fair. Um, so I think having no, them knowing that they're kind of keeping a list of things that they can talk to their sales leader about. So just a fantastic opportunity to gain trust um, and build rapport with your team member and make sure that they feel they're supported. So, um, you know, and then the other is like, there's just no question people get pushed out there um, with full quota too soon sometimes, or the opposite, no quota expectation. And I think there's a happy medium where we all have been in a scenario in sales where we felt our personal targets have been unreasonable. We don't want people to feel that way. We want it to be a stretch, but we want it to be achievable. So I think really having good, a good solid basis for why you, well, for, for targets you put in place are achievable, but also your reasoning on, on why they're achievable. Um, those are all, those are all very important points. And then, of course, the final one is just that, you know, how passionate I am about coaching. And so understanding the differentiators um, of your organization, being able to articulate them with the what, uh, what we do, the so what, here's how we do it. And hey, here's a customer story it relates to in under a minute. That's gold. Uh, I would say I'm just throwing a number out there based on our experience at replays, but I probably not off more than 10%. I think 80% of reps can't effectively do, aren't supported to the point where they can effectively do that. So I think you're winning if after the first few weeks, you've got uh, your new SDR or BDR having a repository of three to five customer stories for different customer personas, personas and use cases that help articulate your differentiating points. That's awesome, man. Yeah. So just what we've been talking about, don't throw your new reps into the wild without any sort of process in place to get feedback from management, right? Make sure that their quota isn't insane. So they feel so overwhelmed. Um, and make sure they're comfortable with your market, your ICPs, the messaging you use to communicate your value prop. Um, make sure they're able to communicate those customer stories that, you know, Rava and Dave are talking about. Uh, we just got a question from Chase. Oh my God, Chase. I'm going to put you your last name, but I'm going to give it a shot. Masuroni, Chase Masuroni, uh, how do you clearly outline process expectations for a rep within the first few months? A lot of times I've seen SDRs fail from not being an expert in the prospecting tools available. So it may seem like a, a, a tech stack question, like how do you make sure they are familiar with the tools that you use on your team to prospect into new accounts? Yeah, um, this is a great question because this is a cornerstone of good onboarding for Vidyard because we do have a lot of technology for our BDR and SDR teams. So um, clearly outlining the process, number one, uh, we don't start here. It's, it, this is the last part of onboarding that we arrive at. We get a lot of curiosity questions like how do we use Sales Loft and how do we use LinkedIn Sales Navigator? Um, we, we do it this way on purpose because we want to have the recency effect of going through all of this tech technology that you're going to use just about before you're about to actually do the emailing and phone calls of your of your job. It's also kind of the least important part, in my opinion. The, the most important part is ICP, buyer personas, things like that. Um, so that's number one. We, we wait until the end so that they're ready to learn before they actually start their role. Uh, and then we have pre-created content, like I mentioned, where um, after they're set up on everything, so day one, they have their logins and I go through at a very high level what each technology piece is for. Uh, and then they have videos to watch on how does this tool work? Two to three minutes on how, why do we use this tool and how does it work? And it's, because it's visual and it's a technology that they need to use, it's way better than discussing it verbally, for instance. Um, the other piece is that uh, I 
their mentor should spend, it's kind of like a crash course, a couple hours on what their workflow is going to be. And then they also spend a day shadowing their mentor and, and not just passively shadowing, but watching what the mentor does in sales law, for instance, and then also doing it for their own leads right beside them at the desk beside them. So that's how we make sure because te the tech stack can be a learning curve. So that's how we have fail safes in place to make sure people are comfortable with the process. So you actually create videos, you create videos that your reps can go and reference for each one of your pieces of tech. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's really cool. I know I, I use YouTube all the time. If I don't know how to do something, I'm on YouTube researching it. It's, you know, so you guys are actually took that in house and you're having your experts in house experts create videos on how to use each piece of tech. It's yeah. Great, and it's a great idea. I mean, in the end, we're all consumers, right? So if we're watching YouTube to answer our questions at home, that's probably how we want to answer the questions in the business. Um, and so we find it's, it really works well. Mm -hmm. Anything you would add on there, Dave, to that question of clearly outlining expectations of like, it could be tech stack. Uh, it could be, you know, the messaging that you're using to communicate value of your product. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Let's talk about tech stack. And then there, there is around sort of general expectations long term in the role. I think that's important to cover as well. So a couple thoughts there. But in terms of tech stack, that is such an important part. I'm glad that someone brought that up. It's like, uh, so I agree with Ray, like building a repeatable, scalable uh, system where there's, for example, videos that people can go see on that is important because uh, frustration level in the role can ramp up very, very quickly if they don't know how to use uh, Salesforce effectively or Salesloft or whatever tools that you put in their uh, fingertips and uh, or, or at least being able to maximize the ability that those, those have. So having a portion of your onboarding that's tech stack 101, absolutely critical, it has to be in there. Um, but I think you hit on a good point in terms of just general expectations. I think we talked a lot about in your onboarding, what are things supposed to look like in the first 30, 60, 90 days? But I think it's super important to level set what the expectations are um, over the tenure of a person in that SDR role. Um, and, you know, this is something that throughout the interview process, I always would articulate that, hey, just so you know, we believe in your development and we want to get you to that AE role if that's where you want to go. But, but we expect that you absolutely spend at least a year in this role first. And quite frankly, because we need to get our return for our investment, people just start ramping up to getting the right level of pipe uh, after the first few months. And if they then get promoted five or six months later, you actually haven't got your return on that role. I don't mean to look at it from a crass business perspective that way. And there's always outliers, of course, for why you might promote someone earlier, but as an expectation, I think it's important, at least this is the way I personally see it, um, is that they, they, set, they, they first and foremost crush it in that role to prove that they can move to the next role. I think the second is talking about career path and, and really understanding where they want to go and how they want to get there and letting them know that you do have a path for that and you will have whatever the company's process is to ensure that uh, you're setting out a path to get there and that you'll support them in getting there. And the third thing that I al absolutely always do is, and again, this is back to kind of the golden rule, in my opinion, is what I try to aspire to. Don't get me wrong. I don't always achieve that, but I try to aspire to and how would I want to be treated? And it's like people want to know um, – a lot of people in sales are driven by fear. And the last thing we want, at least in my opinion, is to build a culture of fear. We want it to be a culture driven by motivation for success, et cetera. But um, a lot of the fear is what happens if I don't hit target? So I'm very crystal clear with my uh, SDRs when they start that here's our process if you're not hitting target, right? So here's what we're gonna expect for success in, in the first three months. And then this is what full quota looks like. But if you don't hit target, here's what automatically happens, right? So for example, in month one, I will have a conversation. I'll be like, hey, you're not hitting target. Uh, let's talk about why. How can we support you? Where, where, did you not have the right tools? Was it just a bad month? Because, hey, all of us sales reps have good months, bad months, good quarters, bad quarters. Um, but then we talk about uh, if you miss in month two, okay, it starts to become potentially alarming. Um, and then month three, it's like, no, we need to actually put you on a formal performance improvement plan. And of course, everyone's got their own process. And I'm just talking in generalities. But I think it's important for the rep to know, I think we owe it to them to know um, what that eventuality looks like if things aren't successful. And I actually think it helps them for them to know that they're not just going to show up one day and be gone. It's that, hey, no, if things aren't working out, 
And in terms of what success looks like after month uh, six, nine, 12, we actually have a program to support you on that. It's very clear and here's what it is. Uh, so I, I think that's important as well. It seems like a big theme of, you know, our talk today is supporting your reps, right? It's essentially what onboarding is, like being there from step one all the way through the end of onboarding, which is what you're talking about. Um, just being there for your reps as management. So that's awesome. So guys, we have five minutes left. So if you have any questions that you want to ask Dave or Reva about onboarding, about coaching, uh, now is the time to do it. Right there in the chat, all panel panelists and attendees, you know, fire away. We got five minutes left. Or if you guys, Rave or Dave, if you have any points you want to riff on before we get off, I mean, while we're waiting for questions to roll in, riff away. Well, you know, I, I'll say one thing as a, you know, for all the sales leaders on the call here, when you have a vacancy in an SDR role, it is so tempting to just get a warm body in that seat. Um, and I know I'm using cliches here, but uh, the truth is it is so worthwhile waiting for that right person. The cost of churn, um, of employee churn, is so high in terms of the investment. Think about how much we just talked about that it takes for any of us sales leaders to invest time in getting a rep up to speed and the time it takes them to get up to speed. So I think ensuring fit, uh, not only for you, but for the rep is important. So one suggestion there is, um, and I've done this many times before, is as we're going through the interview process to make sure it's a good fit, not just for us, but for the rep, have them come in for a day. And, um, and actually shadow one of the SDRs to really look, see what a day in the life looks like. Um, that to me, um, we, we would have much less employee churn when we would do that with a rep because they're going in eyes open. Yeah, awesome point, awesome point. And I'll just mention, um, because I know we had talked about creating these videos and if anyone is interested in creating these videos, you can do it completely free using Vidyard. So it, it does, you don't need to, you know, buy into one of our plans. We have that free Chrome extension where if you want to start testing out your customer pitches or your customer customer stories through video and or if you're a manager of a team and you want to start having your teams kind of submit those to you you could do that for free actually which could be a, a cool way to get started we have uh, Shannon here saying she uses Vidyard for onboarding vids already uh, and she is seriously awesome to use I also have that Chrome extension it is seriously awesome to use uh, I'd also encourage anyone on the webinar still to check out replays. Uh, Dave is doing some really, really fun stuff. I don't know if you want to dive into that quickly, Dave. What is replays all about again? Sure, thanks. Yeah, the idea is instead of having to train up your reps for Monday to Friday in some boardroom somewhere on sales process, these days, because we've got uh, the benefit of call recordings, uh, folks send our, our awesome inside sales professionals who have been inside sales professionals, taken sales process training, and actually been sales leaders with leading brands around the world. Um, they send us our coaches the videos. We review the videos, uh, the actual demos or um, the SDR calls, and we give feedback on screen saying, maybe you could have handled that objection a little bit differently. Here's a repeatable process. And we use our replays 48 point re model uh, to coach to. And then we do live one-on-ones with them for a half hour over Zoom. The idea is it can all be consumed um, outside of selling hours. So for sales leaders that are um, scaling their team quickly and they don't have as much time to actually call record um, and, and, and call coach rather, or they want their team onboarded quickly, we do this for small startups of two or three people uh, right up to massive organizations. That's amazing. Okay, guys, we are out of time. Thank you both for joining us today. This was super valuable. Uh, everyone on the webinar now, we're going to send out a recording. So if you want to rewatch it, go over anything we covered in more detail, check your inbox in the next 24 hours or so, it'll be there. Thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate it. We hope to see you on another Sales Hacker webinar soon.